Good afternoon. It's Wednesday, the 13th of June, 2018, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. Your host today, Mike Robinson, myself, Brian Gerrish. We're also joined by Alex Thompson with Eastern Approaches. And of course, Alex reporting from the very low lands of the Netherlands. Uh, well, Trump. Yes, well, let's, let's uh, come back to, to uh, Trump and uh, Kim. After Kim left back to head back to North Korea yesterday, uh, Donald Trump gave a press conference uh, where he surprised a few people by announcing that uh, the United States would end the war games uh, that were planned for uh, South Korea, uh, apparently to the, sh the disappointment of the Japanese, but anyway, that's beside the point. Uh, he said, we'll stop the war games, which will save us a tremendous amount of, of money. Uh, plus, I think it's very provocative. Uh, he uh, he uh, said that he was, you know, it was ridiculous the amount of money that was being spent flying uh, U.S. bombers from Guam uh, up to the uh, up to South Korea for these war games and sending them back again, really having achieved not very much. Uh, he said that uh, you know they've got thirty-two thousand soldiers in South Korea. He wants to be bringing them home as quickly as possible. Uh, and as you would perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, this. Uh, has had the usual responses. So people uh, pretty upset about what's been going on uh, yesterday and the, uh, and the day before. <laughs> I beg your pardon. We had Mr. Trump breaking in there. How, breaking, did, how, yes. did, that how did that happen? Yes. Uh, and uh, so uh, we've got the Independent here reporting uh, Trump's explanation for stopping North Korea war games. Ridiculous, says top Republican senator. Uh, a whole host of people commenting on what happened. Uh, seeing U.S. flag alongside North Korea was North Korea's was disgusting, <laughs> says ex-CIA official. Uh, so uh, clearly the warmongers uh, not terribly excited about what Trump did yesterday. Uh, they're either downplaying it as being nothing very important uh, or they're directly uh, slagging it off, uh, as with this news headline. Uh, Alex, let's bring you in, into the program here. What were your thoughts on what uh, what Trump pulled off with uh, with Kim? As always, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, Mike, but it is really spectacular. I see Kim Jong-un uh, Jong sorry, quoted for his part, saying that both of the countries have decided to bury the hatchet and let bygones be bygones, which even for him is extremely risky. People can blow off all the hot air they want about uh, President Trump and his relations with Congress and the White House and his party. But for Kim, you know, who is basically he's been held hostage for several years now by his own generals and being uh, playing a, a game of cat and mouse, who can execute whom to stay alive? Uh, Kim, this is really uh, you know a, a do or die moment because he could easily have the military stab him in the back. So this implies to me that he has the military, which is a very conniving, evil. Uh, military that works people to death like the totalitarian regimes in Europe in the past did. Uh, they seem to have calculated that they too see no future for that model and they do want to go towards something more productive and uh, trade based. Uh, I'm also seeing, as always happens in many of these cases, the continental press in lockstep, the French business paper Les Echo talking about the risible and disgusting spectacle of President Trump. They just cannot stand the fact that we're getting out, apparently, or making baby steps towards getting out of a 70 or 80 year um, dead, deadlock in which, of course, the major beneficiaries are the entrenched lobby interests and military industrial complex. Um, well, you make a good point there. And the first question, I can't I think it was uh, a ABC uh, journalist. Uh, and uh, the first question that was asked in the Q&A following Trump's statement yesterday was, uh, was you know, well, well, Kim Jong-un is this uh, brutal dictator that is uh, murdering people in their beds and so on. Um, and he was quite uh, determined that actually, in his opinion, he said Kim had done a, a pretty good job as a 26-year-old taking over the, uh, the leadership of the country under the circumstances. Uh, and he, he immediately uh, put her in her place. And I'll just, uh, if you've got a few more thoughts about what you just said about, about Kim uh, and the regime there, I mean, uh, do you think that he has the Trump's assessment of, of his ability to run that country as a 26-year-old is fair? Uh, or has he been, as you, as you hinted a second ago, that utterly controlled up to this point? Kim has definitely been controlled, uh, and so has the whole regime. If you look at the Korean War and how the uh, demarcation along that parallel was uh, put in place, we usually are told that Stalin has the blame for that. But uh, if you look at how General MacArthur was removed from post by Dean Acheson and other cabal plotters in the State Department in particular, the US has a lot to do with it and the Brits behind them because uh, some more or less banned materials from the Korean War period show that the Brits directly ordered the Americans uh, not to win the Korean War and sacrifice our own troops 
for it. The Glorious Gloucesters, the regiment local to GCHQ, um, had horrendous losses on the Injin River, which had never been forgotten, uh, fighting the Chinese. This was all a bit of a machination, or a huge machination. And so the three generations of Kim, or four, because it's recently come out that the current Kim has a son, um, uh, have really been held hostage by their own military, which has lines of command and control to the West, particularly the um, the Blue Empire, the State Department based empire. That there's always been that dynamic in there. Uh, Sébastien Falletti, a French journalist, it's only available in French so far. He's published a book called La Piste Kim, uh, which is about uh, Kim Jong Un in, in, in how he really is, uh, which I'm just starting to get through. Uh, it's a very different read from anything else available in English, with the possible exception of. Um, uh, a book by a chap called Myers, who lives in South Korea and actually speaks Korean. He has a, ra a book called The Cleanest Race, How the North Koreans See Themselves and Why It Matters. If you look at these angles, very unusual uh, for people to be writing in English who understand the Koreans and speak the language, then you see much more a case of North Korea for decades having been told we are surrounded by enemies in the world, the dirty Japs, the scheming Americans. And uh, this is the way they've gone through the, you know, the last 70 years. Some of them have been evil and sadistic and kept whole generations in concentration camps, but many more have just been in fear of their lives, thinking that any moment they're going to have the great powers roll in and crush them. And there's good reason for them thinking that, because they lost 10 to 20 percent of their population in a horrendous war of bombing and, and starvation in the 50s. Mm. OK, thank you very much for that, Alex. I'd just add that there are some extremely good documentaries on the Korean War. Uh, which you can pick up on YouTube. Um, and aside from the analysis of the military side, what always comes to the fore is the huge suffering um, in civilians, both north and south of the border. So uh, if you don't know much about the Korean War, encourage people to have a, a revisit, really, and learn some of the, uh, some of the events, because it was horrific. Um, well, speaking of huge suffering of civilians, uh, that brings us in onto Yemen, uh, and the attack uh, has started on Hadida, as we were talking about yesterday. Uh, and uh, so this is uh, Yemen, so-called Yemen government forces. There is no, there are no Yemen government forces in this case. Uh, obviously, Saudi Arabia, UAE, uh, involved in this. Uh, they've launched their offensive on the so-called rebel-held port of Hadida. Uh, and uh, this is important because uh, so many people, you know, the vast majority of people in Yemen requiring uh, food to come through that port, aid to come through that port. Uh, this is going to result in the deaths of civilians in huge numbers. Uh, but Saudi Arabia says, don't worry, because we're going to make Hadida much bigger and much better uh, once this is finished. Uh, conflicting reports about what's happened this morning. The, uh, the Yemeni National Salvation Government uh, spokesperson has said that they had a, they had targeted a, a UAE warship off the coast uh, of Hadera and sunk it. Uh, I haven't seen that uh, formally confirmed yet, uh, but obviously there have been pretty intense so-called coalition airstrikes against the port uh, and uh, pretty heavy fighting. So uh, this, as I say, is going to result in, in the deaths of uh, many, many people. Uh, and uh, with what? British supplied weapons? In uh, as always, Mike. Uh, uh, as always. Uh, right, we'll move on to this. Uh, this is an article from News24. It says, South African Friends of Israel devastated by suspension of Johannesburg councillor. Uh, and this is uh, uh, the, a, a Johannesburg councillor who said basically that Johannesburg uh, was a friend of Israel. And this is fantastic. Uh, but unfortunately, the, uh, the local uh, Council didn't agree with her, and so she's been suspended, uh, Dr. Uh, Mifuo uh, Palazzi. Uh, and basically, the, uh, the mayor uh, said that uh, the rep remarks that she made didn't adequately address the complexity and sensitivity issue. They caused confusion. Now, what is at the heart of this? Well, in fact, uh, South Africa uh, has responded quite strongly to what Israel has done in recent weeks to the Palestinians uh, and uh, have threatened to cut diplomatic ties. Uh, the uh, is the pro-Israeli lobby, including the Zionist Federation and so on, are extremely upset about this. They've set up a petition in South Africa to, to try and stop the South African government from breaking diplomatic ties with, uh, with Israel. Uh, but, uh, I, Alex, I just wonder what your thoughts are on, on this. It's not really being covered by the, by the British or Western press, as far as I can see. 
it's very difficult to get accurate reports out of South Africa because, every, because everything is so massively politicized now. Um, you know, people are rightly horrified at what's happening to the Boers, the full Marxification of particularly the ANC, but uh, other black majority parties as well. Um, the main point is that, you know, anyone in South African politics these days has got heavies behind them. People tend to look at the Marxist type heavies, uh, but Israel has had a, a long hand in this as well. Look at the rise of the communist movement and its brutality in the apartheid regime, especially towards other blacks. And this was uh, stage managed from abroad by a, an Israel backed man called Joe Slobo, who lived in exile after the South African uh, administration realized what he was up to. So uh, many intrigues going on, a long history between Israel and South Africa, sanctions busting in the 70s and 80s, export of orange juice from one country to be sold by the other, depending on uh, which country was more in the tar targets for, spot for sanctions at the particular time. They have a long history as governments of uh, solidarity against the world, as it were, when there's justified outrage about what's happening in either country. And of course, they've been involved in nuclear testing of each other's uh, devices as well. OK, thank you for that. Now let's uh, move on to back to the UK. And uh, yesterday, uh, the City UK Annual Conference was taking place, uh, Annual Conference 2018. This is all about global trends shaping the industry, uh, part of the city's agenda. And uh, well, we had uh, uh, John Glenn MP speaking at this event. Uh, he said, uh, well, he said this, I can envision a world where the city, that's the city of London, is no longer understood as a monolithic entity bounded by the physical geography of the square mile, but something else entirely, a world where the city of London remains and prospers as a hub, but with spokes spread across the regions of this country. Uh, our children can come to know and aspire to work in the city, or rather cities, of Manchester, Liverpool, Bristol or Edinburgh. So that's fantastic. We're going to replace, uh, you know, useful uh, constructive, productive employment with uh, uh, financial technology. Uh, computing, quantitative and technological literacy are called for, he said, more now than ever before as we stand on the cusp of a fourth industrial revolution. This revolution will have a profound impact on jobs, the way we work, the way we choose to work. So at the heart of the government's innovative, sorry, innovation and growth strategy is a drive uh, to cement a robust supply of skills designed for our brave new world. Uh, but he, he went on to talk about Brexit and immigration and he said, uh, as the new Home Secretary has said, even though we do need a more sustainable level of net migration, uh, we want to welcome the highly skilled people British businesses need. We need to continue developing an immigration system that works for the economy. To this end, the Migration Advisory Committee has been commissioned to report on the role of the EU nationals in the labour market and will report in September. Uh, we want to ensure that our new partnership with the EU protects the mobility of professionals uh, to provide services across the continent. It is in this, in the interests of both sides that uh, this exchange of talent continues at pace. So yet again, we have another speech from another government minister uh, at another event uh, where they, Alex, reiterate once again uh, that nothing is going to change following Brexit. Uh, we're going to maintain the status quo. Yes. Wasn't John Glenn the first man in space, although with a double N? And I think uh, this member of parliament seems to have the same sense of uh, the terrestrial and uh, of the popular will. Uh, it's almost uh, re you know, unbelievable how much defiance there is of the popular will now. It goes back to the point of whether members of parliament are there to obey our orders, as I said at Winchester uh, British Constitution Group Conference in 2016 at the end of my talk, or whether they're there as they now like to claim. Uh, to exercise their own conscience, which is a, a polite way of saying stuff the people. Uh, absolutely. The language is interesting, isn't it? Is this, um, is this the language of an illuminated person who's fully on board with the policy of the City of London, which of course is not the, uh, not the capital city of UK, or is he a useful idiot? That's the bit that comes into my mind. Um, but Alex, uh, false flag hacks best done in secret? Yes, this is a third sector type uh, publication, NextGov, one of the American based ones, but they're increasingly global blobs across the whole English speaking world. And NextGov is, is trailing with its questions that it doesn't answer. But uh, what I've put is a summary of it here. The article is drifting in uh, based on the Atlanta cyber attack or hack recently. The notion that it's the third sector themselves that they should decide who's told what after what we're told is a cyber attack, which, of course, we're always being told in Britain and Europe now could happen because of the nasty Ruskies at any time. 
And the suggestion is that, uh, yes, deta known details are withheld when Western cities infrastructure is attacked, uh, but this is merely done to save face and it's nothing more than a failure to observe IT industry best practice. There's no uh, question of lawfulness and duty to the public here. You know, move along, nothing to see. Yeah, but, but again, it's showing this linking together government and the third, sec uh, third sector, whether it's charities or NGOs, this is all gradually being interlinked. Yes. Uh, now, uh, one subject that uh, we've covered extensively over the years is the issue of family courts uh, and uh, the workload uh, on, fa fa sorry, on family courts has been increasing. Uh, and according to uh, Sir Andrew McFarland, who's the incoming president of the Family Law Division, uh, this increase is untenable. Uh, so he is speaking today at the launch of the Care Crisis Review. And this review came out of uh, the concerns of Sir James Munby, the previous or the outgoing uh, president of the Family Law Division. Uh, and so this organisation, the Family Rights Group, uh, backed up or financed by the Nuffield Trust, have produced this report, the Care Crisis Review. Uh, and they say that the Care Crisis Re Review uh, is chaired by Ni Nigel Richardson. I'll come on to him in a second. Uh, a former director of Children's Services in Leeds. Uh, and it's facilitated by the Family Rights Group. It comes as the number of children in care has reached its highest level since 1985. And the number of care proceedings brought by local authorities has also risen year on year to nearly 15,000 in 2016-17. So they aimed in this report to, to examine the reasons for the rise in care proceedings uh, and the number of children in care uh, to at all times retain a focus on the achievement uh, on achieving the best outcomes for children and families to take account of the current national economic, financial, legal and policy context that impacts on families and local authorities and court practice and to identify specific changes uh, to local authority and court systems and national local policies and practices that will help safely stem the increase in the number of care cases coming before the family courts. Uh, so basically uh, what they're saying is that uh, there's been such a rise in the number of uh, care proceedings taken against families uh, that the courts can no longer count, uh, uh, can, can no longer cope, sorry, particularly uh, in this age of austerity. Uh, and uh, so Mr. Richardson was speaking on uh, the Radio 4 Today programme this morning, and he was saying that this relentless increase in uh, children coming into care uh, comes at the same time that there's a relentless decrease in resources in the care system. Uh, and uh, he, was, you know, he was calling this a perfect storm. Uh, and he was saying that basically, uh, you know, there's always risk involved when making decisions about uh, what's in the best interests of children in the, when they're making care assessments. Uh, and so what he's saying is that the people working in the care system have become risk averse and they'll always err on the side of caution, i.e. get the child into care uh, rather than trying to offer uh, some kind of measures that would help the family and keep the child in the family situation. So he's saying that the, that the one of the outcomes from this, this review is that uh, uh, there will be more effort to try to make use of the family itself and also the wider network, the wider family network to try to uh, get families to create their own care pr uh, plans uh, and keep people out of the care, keep children out of the care system itself. But I just wanted to highlight one quote from the uh, from the document. Uh, which said that other options for change emphasise the importance of shared visions and ethos across agencies with leaders giving a consistent message, including modelling the way they want others to act. And it seems no matter where we go with this, Brian, uh, we always end up with the common purpose language in, in, uh, in these reports. Uh, and the sort of, I don't even know how to describe this, but, the, but this type of, of approach uh, always seems to take precedence over what's uh, really in the best interests of children. This is the development of the hive mind. Uh, there is a line, there's a policy, uh, and uh, you need to follow that policy. You need to use the right language. If you do that, you're going to get on. You're going to get on in your position. And if you behave in the right way. If you behave in the right way, you're going to get on. And if you don't, you're going to be ostracised. Eventually, you'll be outlawed if you continue to uh, protest. So this is building the hive. And of course, the other gentleman who's talking about the tentacles of the city of London, this uh, hive system is going to spread out worldwide. Uh, let's look at the reality of uh, what the British system does with... Uh, uh, the care of children and uh, we're bringing in the subject of Melanie Shaw 
Uh, now let's remind ourselves, this is uh, an article that uh, we wrote back on the 13th of January 2017, um, pointing out that Melanie, Melanie Shaw had been given a two-year custodial sentence back in 2016. Um, nobody quite knew what that was because uh, it was effectively a secret court hearing. And we put some definitions in here in our report. We said that basically by secret court hearing, the UK column news means that A, a court hearing was not listed publicly until after it took place. B, a court hearing whose outcome, i.e. of what alleged crime Melanie Shaw has been convicted, is withheld from the public on request to the puzzlement of some court staff themselves. By these two definitions, UK Column News is quite confident in describing Melanie Shaw as a political prisoner. Well, the significance of our report today on Melanie is that uh, w most people would normally only serve half their prison sentence. So she was sentenced to two years. She should have expected to have been out after one year. We're now approaching the two year mark. She spent over 18 months in solitary confinement. And at the moment, uh, nobody knows what's happening to Melanie Shaw. Now, Alex, um, you've got a very interesting document here that's uh, been sent asking key questions about Melanie. This is a follow up to the same viewers questions to the prison, uh, sorry, to number 10 Downing Street and then onwards to the Ministry of Justice. And eventually a reply came from the prison service uh, saying, sorry, Data Protection Act can't tell you anything about her. Uh, nothing daunted, the same viewer wrote on the left to the prison uh, service and uh, to the on the right to the minister responsible, Rory Stewart, often reported on. I won't read the whole letters, we have a lot to get through, but in the left, look at uh, how she's addressing him or her dear question mark because of course it was signed by a team as often happens these days. And she's saying, I haven't asked for any personal information about Mrs. Shaw. I've asked why she's in prison, why she's been in solitary and what the usual sentence is for the offence in question. As you were saying, Brian, that's not uh, information even given to court staff. Um, and then on the right, we see Rory Stewart being taken to task. Um, she uh, here the viewer repeats uh, what nonsense she was told in the letter from the prison service last time and she says the questions I'm asking is what's the offence why secret court what did she do to get convicted merit the conviction what's the usual sentence for that offence because sentencing guidelines in place these days so we should know that why should Melanie be kept in solitary confinement for the greater part of her two-year sentence and when will she be released and then in the red box, I've uh, got a, a purple passage really from her summoning the provisions of the Data Protection Act in order to avoid explaining why an individual is being deprived of his or her liberty constitutes a direct attack on the common law guarantee that justice should not only be done, but be seen to be done. When trials are held behind closed doors, uh, which of course is a legal term as well, um, intra uh, muros and so on, and, and in, in camera, justice has not been seen to be done. You, Mr. Stewart, this is key, name and frame the target. As Minister of State for Justice, must brush aside the data protection fig leaf and answer the questions I've been asking in relation to Melanie's in-camera conviction. If I and many others asking those same questions are to be convinced that we're still living under the rule of law. Unless you give me some credible answers, unless you give me some credible answers, I can only conclude that one, no reasonable justification can be offered for Melanie's prolonged incarceration and inhumane treatment, two, that she is indeed a political prisoner, and th that's of course what the British government goes around the world wrapping other people over the knuckles for, and three, that the government is hiding behind the Data Protection Act in order to protect interests other than those of law-abiding British subjects. Again, we get to the question of for whom is our government governing? So well done that viewer, and please, many more people write in the same vein. Uh, well, this is essential because as we're going to see in just a few moments, we are really not sure what is happening to Melanie, but reports do not seem good. Um, but uh, you wanted to highlight an Orwell quote, political language is destined to make lies sound truthful and murder respectable uh, and to give solidity to pure wind. Uh, people who elect corrupt uh, politicians are not victims, but accomplices. Yes, because, of course, uh, we like to apply that to, uh, we like to take the, the politicians to task, but we elect them. It's the quality of the people that determines the politicians in the end, not a popular stance to take in the alternative media to blame the people. But ultimately, I'm afraid we do have to. We elect the buffoons like Rory Stewart and the vested interests. And indeed, the viewer ended that letter by uh, signing off with the same uh, motto that UK Column signed off with, qui taquet considere videtur, anyone who's silent is considered to be going along with it, to be acquiescing. And of course, that can be uh, a finger pointed at the politicians. If you don't reply, then we'll take you as guilty in the matter. But it's also to the people. If we go along with these politicians, then we are acquiescing in their rule, yes. their misrule. 
Yes, but in the meantime, the Lord Chief Justice seems to be saying to hell with due process. This is the laughable Lord Burnett of Malden, who's taken over from Lord John Thomas of Comgeath as the Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales. And here he is talking at the annual Sir Henry Brooke Lecture. Uh, shortly after taking post, and he's talking about what Melanie Shaw went through, although, of course, he would never uh, mention her by name. But he's talking about video hearings and saying the extent to which video hearings will be used in all jurisdictions, because the UK has several jurisdictions for foreign viewers, will be a matter for judges to determine applying the rules and practice directions. Those are the real killers. The attorney general puts out political practice directions, which actually uh, thwart the common law in many cases by binding judges hands. And The practice directions tell us exactly whom the judges are working for, not the people. And, he says, where necessary, they'll be determined by hearing submissions. Much of this criticism, i.e. UK column talking about Melanie's video hearings, results from commentators misunderstanding what is envisaged and then subjecting the resulting Aunt Sally to attack. That's a straw man. Where the use of video links is... Uh, and are we now going to hear words like unlawful? No. Where the use of video links is not appropriate, they will not be used. Oh, thank you, Your Lordships, for telling us that. I'm sure you'll be determining that yourselves. Post-reform, as now, trials in the Crown Court and the Magistrates' Court, with the possible exception of the single justice procedure, will still take place in the courtroom with all appropriate technology. There are those who suggest that any participation by LiveLink, whatever part the person is playing in the proceedings, brings with it a risk of diminished justice because it is a lesser form of participation. Well, it is if you're minimally sure and your co connection keeps getting yanked at crucial moments. The use of video links and other remote technology must, of course, be sensitive to evidence-based concerns resulting from research into its effects, all of which will be considered with care, not only by Her Majesty's Courts and Tribunal Service, but also by the judiciary when considering the parameters of that use. But the use of remote video access to court hearings has been with us for more than a decade. Well, that's quite an admission. And I do wonder whether some are overplaying this concern. And he goes on to say that there's many, that for many types of hearing and witnesses, there is no disadvantage in using a video link. It's incredible stuff. Uh, but in, in person, remote and machine interpreting a challenge. So uh, are we talking about uh, using uh, technology for for what? Real-time interpretation? Yes. Um, under the common law, there's due process. And even if you go to civil law and um, government-granted law under the European Court of Human uh, Convention on Human Rights, there's the right to a fair trial. And both of these require accurate human live interpreting by qualified professional interpreters uh, for anyone whose first language is not English, regardless of their nationality. But uh, in the final paragraph, or penultimate paragraph of his speech to the uh, Henry... Um, um, uh, Brook Society, sorry for getting the great man's name, yes. Uh, Lord Burnett says, it is important that uh, we do not lose sight of what is going on in the world around us and the rapid advance of technology. Now here you see the Law Society and the Lord Chief Justice as slick salesmen for cartel software industries. I have little doubt that within a few years, high quality, and he doesn't even use the right term, he calls it simultaneous translation, a big howler, it's interpreting, interpreting is not translation. Simultaneous interpreting, he should have said, will be available and see the end of interpreters. Incredible. I am still in awe of instant translation when I search online. So the twit has not worked out the difference between Google Translate for a, buying a, a car, you know, and getting a manual and having someone interpreted in court. I am still in awe of Google Translate. The result is not yet perfect, but not bad. You know, so you're going to get people uh, speaking in, in uh, strange dialect who don't know the legal terminology. And apparently a computer is going to pick up that voice instantly and, and, trans and interpret it into the right turn of phrase in English common law. Uh, but Alex, it's artificial uh, intelligence. Uh, yeah. yeah, I was just going to say, Alex, uh, you're just uh, there's just a bit of bitterness here about the fact that uh, some AI bot is going to come and take your job in the not too distant future, right? Well, I don't have to be bitter, Mike, because a great colleague of mine in Edinburgh, uh, Jonathan Downey, whose uh, website is, uh, or his company is called Integrity Languages, Integrity is certainly something the Law Society and the Judiciary lack these days, uh, put up a challenge which is on the right-hand side of that slide, and he's actually throwing down the gauntlet. I think that he's actually getting the industry behind him at a rate of knots, because the Law Gazette's report was so fawning over this. Oh, we're going to see the end of interpreters. So Jonathan's saying, why don't we have a real-time trial with sim simultaneous interpreting uh, in person and via video link and as a third option one of these uh, you know bots uh, doing a robotic voice and he's actually su suggesting a venue in Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh 
uh, where he himself uh, hangs out. So th this is evidence, well, it's evidence of cluelessness and living in a bubble uh, that people think that translation equals interpreting and that interpreters are just people who, uh, who are, you know, he calls us steam age technology. Uh, you know, as if we weren't, you know, it's, it's the most cognitively uh, taxing job in the world, along with being a pilot, being an interpreter, you know, thousands of hours of study and so on. And people actually fry their brains doing interpreting if they're not careful. Uh, but that aside, uh, Jonathan has actually thrown down the gauntlet now and said, come on, then let's see your technology at work. This isn't just buffoonery. Uh, this is um, the, the hand in the glove here. This is, this is uh, the Law Society as a business, uh, because, of course, last year, his predecessor, Lord uh, John Thomas, said that we're going to turn Wales into a different jurisdiction from England because it will yield more business for Wales. And even back in the 80s, when my father rang up the Law Society to say, why are you employing crooks as solicitors? Uh, what kind of men do you have on your books and why won't you struck them out? What kind of men are these? The cool response came down the phone line, businessmen, sir. So yeah. even back then, the Law Society was making no bones about that. Yeah. Well, let's come back on technology and show where some of the simpler things can take us. And uh, uh, we were astonished to discover this, that basically reports about Melanie Shaw and her initial whistleblowing over the children's home Beechwood in Nottingham, those reports have now disappeared from the BBC and the Nottingham Post. People can check this out for yourselves. You look and do a search. You will not find the original articles where Melanie Shaw, uh, Melanie Shaw's face was there. Um, with usually an image of the, the brick-built Beechwood uh, building itself talking about the uh, abuse. It has disappeared. It's been censored. Now, let's bring in this because this was a report from the 12th of December 2014 where we said it's, it's been alleged to the UK column that Nottingham Post uh, cannot report on uh, Beechwood child abuse to, due to control from the police and Nottingham local authorities. Um, now, fascinating that uh, we were told that. Uh, we also spoke to BBC Nottingham at around the same time. We called BBC Nottingham to ask why the BBC was not reporting the Melanie Shaw case uh, that was ongoing at that time. We said that the UK column would be reporting and the, the BBC staff member then suddenly claimed she was being threatened. Well, calls are recorded for protection purposes, so that was complete nonsense. But later they came back, they were obviously feeling a bit squeamish, um, and uh, they said they've reported on that ongoing, very complicated story, but for legal reasons, there are certain things that they cannot report but it is ongoing and they will continue to report where and how they can. And they've certainly done that by taking the reports down. Mm. Um, so let's bring in this gentleman because he's bravely stepped forward as another abuse whistleblower. Uh, his name's Paul Wayne. Uh, he was raped. Um, he was badly treated at home. He was then subsequently raped, but he was also then abused in Beechwood, the very um, children's home that Melanie Shaw talked about. Uh, this is one of the things he said, very harrowing. A member of staff used to line us all up in a row. We then had to wash our genitals in front of him and then turn around and show our backsides to him. At the time, he made out it was all to do with hygiene. I remember once he made me sit in front of him and he grabbed my leg really hard. I cried, and this is the one that uh, I find particularly poignant. Once I reached 16, I started to run away from Beechwood and commit offences. I went off the rails. I was running away. I remember begging the police not to take me back there. And then I was in and out of Borstal. I hated everyone and blamed everyone for what happened to me. So again, we're being told that the police simply took abuse victims back to be re-abused and I'm going to bring in here that this testimony fully supports the original testimony that Melanie Shaw gave to the UK column because in it aside from her own abuse in that children's home she told me very clearly that in her opinion the little boys had it far worse than the girls and so remarkable that Melanie Shaw has now disappeared in prison at the a very time that other reports are coming through of the abuse. This is another report from Nottinghamshire Live. Notice the change. Nottinghamshire Post has now become Nottinghamshire Live. This is part of the countrywide grouping up of our uh, newspaper and media system. Keep your eye on that. Uh, this um, gentleman, Barry Pick, uh, jailed for six years after being found guilty of indecent assault and indecency with a child. 
he'd done other things, but the key point was that he was an abuser working in Beechwood Children's Home. So again, what Melanie said was correct. And then bring in top brass, Rob Griffin, Chief Superintendent from the Knotts Police. Now he's working on Operation Equinox, which has supposedly taken over from Operation Daybreak, which was the police operation created by Melanie Shaw's whistleblowing. Um, he says that in the particular case we, we've just shown on the screen, the women in both of these cases have shown incredible bravery and composure during our investigation and in extremely testing circumstances. In both cases, they've had to wait over 25 years to know that it was Scott who had attacked them and see him finally brought to justice. And uh, he goes on here saying that Nottinghamshire Police is liaison with the media in ensuring court results and images are publicised has played a big part in the case. Well, this is remarkable since around Melanie Shaw, the exact opposite was happening, that everything was being silenced as this woman was uh, brutalised through the court and later through the prison service. So we've shown this before. These are some of the people who were in the wings as Melanie Shaw was sent down. We say she's now a political prisoner, prisoner to silence her while the child abuse um, investigation is going on. I'll leave these on screen for you. But this is uh, going back to 2015 when I was putting out tweets as Melanie Shaw described how she was being harassed and victimised by the police. And we'll remind ourselves, of course, that we have plenty of examples across the country of local authorities covering up. So we've got Rotherham Council staff seizing files and wiping computers to cover up the scale of child sex grooming. This is a key point for all those demonstrators in London recently, that it was the Rotherham Council staff that were helping to cover this up. Uh, we have uh, Chris Eyre, who used unlimited police and mapper assets to hunt Melanie Shaw after her whistle blowing. And uh, we've got the mirror report here. Uh, this is going back some time ago. This is uh, 2014, where he said he supplied underage rent boys for Margaret Thatcher's cabinet ministers. This is part of the report. Uh, Alex, I've got a bit more to say, but I'll just bring you in after that. The evidence is in front of our eyes that it is the public institutions that are covering up the abuse of children. They're doing this in a very calculated uh, way. It's happening across the country. It involves local authorities, police, the major charities. This can't be an accidental system, in my opinion. To me, this is fully orchestrated and coordinated. Uh, we're just now starting to see the evidence break surface. What do you make of it? I think it's a vindication of years of hard work by none other than Brian J. Gerrish. And I have to say, you're a modest man, but you spent your first few years in this uh, field, almost in the wilderness, being uh, called a common purpose bore because you kept going on about those boring council offices when supposedly we were all supposed to be upping and atting at the Muslims. Uh, but now you've been vindicated because we see a vast and complicated control network em emerging from the system of local government and police. Uh, well, thank you for those kind words, Alex. I certainly didn't expect that. Uh, but I thought I'd just pop this man on screen because while I was researching some of the UK column material for today's report, I came across this. Of course, this is another UK column report. Dominic Can Campbell was tweeting out that he'd had a packed day in Sydney taking safeguarding children, supporting disabled people and government-wide technical strategy. So we've got a bit of everything here, Mike, from yeah. all the subjects we've covered today. But this man prides himself on being a disruptor. But here he is boasting back in 2009 through Future Gov that it was going to be his sort using this uh, update of technology in order to control what was happening in government. This is very... Um, I don't like using the word scary, but this is very dark stuff, Mike, that we are starting to see in front of our eyes. Well, it is. And, and uh, well, how, how exactly does he imagine Web 2.0 is going to safeguard children? Is it going to is 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 there going to be some kind of uh, uh, I can't even imagine how, how anybody is going to, how this technology is going to actually step in if, if a child is being abused in a children's home. Yeah. I'm not clear how this how he imagines this is going to work. 
uh, I think in simple terms, they imagine that if they have every piece of information linked together between departments, between individuals, then they see the big picture and therefore they can see, the, see what's coming and prevent the abuse. But of course, if you have a mindset that actually doesn't want to see the abuse, you want to cover the abuse up, you can cover it up at the flick of a switch. Mm. Uh, before I hand over to some um, better, well, not better news, good news about uh, Mr. Hofschra, I just wanted to put this um, UK column image up. This is going back 5th of March, 2015, so three years ago, and we put up the Times article where the headline was called for a national debate on Muslim sex grooming. And we had, um, uh, Nick Clegg laughing at the uh, British public. He was saying, uh, it's work to treat, blame the Muslims for, for paedophilia and all the heat is off Leon Britton, Elm, Guesthouse, Savile and Westminster. Great work by the BBC too. Public, I just love them. Uh, so I'm going to say three years we were warning ago, we were warning about how this was going to be played out. The evidence in the background is that the British government is fully aware of the scale of child abuse, but is running the cover up. And I think we've been spot on on that, Mike. Yes, absolutely. Uh, brief comments, Alex? Brian is spot on about uh, the all seeing eye aspect of uh, the web protecting children, as in protecting our assets or protecting uh, us from, from exposure if we know who's going to whistleblow. Because if you look at that execrable Dominic Campbell and his string puller, uh, Carrie Bishop, uh, a year before that 2009, they were still working for the uh, fi filthy, corrupt London borough of Barnet, an early adopter of all things common purpose. And a year after that 2009 snapshot, they were down in Brighton and Hove uh, working on a system called Patchwork to plug in all the data available from all the services on vulnerable children. Then they went to London to get vulnerable old people uh, have, uh, where, you know, for, as the excuse was uh, a cookery club for people to come around and deliver them hot meals, but uh, basically a network of all the vulnerable old people and then eventually they wanted to develop ways for Alzheimer's patients to be tagged and tracked. So you can see which angle they're coming from. Yeah. Um, OK, let's move on just quick. Before we come on to Hofschwar, just move quickly on to this. Uh, the Sheffield Tree Action Groups, of course, one of the key uh, campaign groups uh, trying to highlight the fact that uh, in British cities, uh, trees are being uh, felled in unnecessarily and uh, in huge numbers. Now, I say unnecessarily, uh, many people suggesting uh, with quite strong evidence uh, that uh, the reason the trees are being felled is to make way for, uh, for 5G uh, wireless networks because uh, the trees get in the way of the signal. They have to come down. Uh, we've seen this here in Plymouth. Uh, and in fact, there, there seems to be more uh, moves towards felling more trees here as well. But Sheffield is, has been taking the lead in this in terms of the publicity, although I understand that Sheffield is not the worst case. Uh, well, today uh, we'll be glad to know that uh, uh, Michael Gove has announced a tree champion. Uh, here he is, uh, William Worsley, the new tree champion. He's going to expand England's woodland. So it's exactly as I thought. Uh, they're going to try and justify the felling of trees in cities uh, by the fact that they had previously announced this, uh, this new forest, which is going to be grown from uh, the west coast of Lancashire across the east coast of Yorkshire. Uh, he's going to make sure that that happens and the trees are grown uh, all over the place. But the words here that, I, that, that the mainstream media has, has uh, grabbed onto is that it says in the uh, government press release, a new tree champion to drive forward planting rates and prevent the unnecessary felling of street trees and this is the key word unnecessary because of course if the reason for the felling is uh, to make way for 5g networks then of course that felling would be viewed as being necessary uh, and so he's not going to do anything to prevent that but what he's going to do i believe is to begin a big pr campaign uh, to say well you don't need to worry about the felling of trees in the cities uh, because we're planting millions of new trees in the countryside and that's going to make up uh, for the trees that are coming down in the cities. Uh, and I believe that's going to be his job. Fascinating, as you're saying this, Mike, of course, on, on our walls, uh, it's off camera, so I'm afraid our viewers can't see it, but we've got a, a street scene um, somewhere in France, but people sat down at cafe tables in the dappled sunlight under probably very big plane trees. And of course, um, those trees give the street and those little restaurants the ambience. Mm. So, um, 
This is really terrible to see them cut down in, in city areas. It absolutely is. Uh, right, brief uh, announcement or a brief reminder that uh, AV9, Alternative View 9 DVDs uh, are available on the UK Column website for pre-order. They'll begin shipping on the 1st of uh, on the 1st of July when the price will go up to the full price. Uh, so get them now while you can. Both Brian and Alex were speaking at that event uh, and uh, a whole range of excellent talks. Now, Alex, we're completely out of time, but we'll, we'll cover the offshore case at the very least. So, uh, so give us an update on what's going on here. On screen is just people's confirmation that uh, Dr. Elizabeth Gethins, who wrote Peter Hofstra's Clean Bell of Mental Health, has actually said, or she has been represented by her recent former employer as having said, I don't want to have any communication in regard to the Hofstra case. So there's the evidence of fear. Uh, the same is true of fear at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office because uh, yesterday, or was it the day before? Uh, no, yesterday it was the Vice Consul of Britain in Vienna came down to Graz to visit Peter on his closed ward, taking three Foreign Office people with him. One was the local consul from Graz City itself. I didn't even know we had a consulate there. Uh, two was uh, his own clipboard carrier, probably from Chancery, the political reporting section, so that Whitehall gets a decent report on it. And three is probably an MI6 lady. And at one point he was saying, they're withholding my medicines and forcing me to take psycho drugs I don't need in order to get the medicines I do need. And they said, how can you prove that? And he just hitched his trouser up, a leg up and said, look at these swollen ankle ankles from the untreated arthritis. So a very good, uh, he's feeling good about that visit. Uh, thanks to Matt Ned Pamphilon, we have some good cartoons. These may end up being featured in a six-pager which News.at, a big news source in Austria, uh, is uh, going to write on the Hofstra case, a huge breakthrough that the Austrian news mainstream is going to do that, thanks to a campaign group called SIM for volunteers in Vienna. Uh, on screen you see the man who put him away in the sectioning order, Professor Manfred Walzel, being caricatured, saying Hofstra is, is wahnsinnig, verrückt, he's mad, he's crazy. He's geistesgestört, he's, he's not right in the head. And of course, because Valtzel's other interest is selling beer, he's in a, in a beer cabal, I think. He's saying, beer, beer, drink more beer. And on screen is his Psychiatrische Berichte, his psychological reports, which he writes hundreds of a year, putting away political prisoners and asset stripping victims. So uh, he's on screen, he's writing, jeder ist verrückt, beer. Everyone's mad, now off to go and swill some beer. Uh, here's another cartoon in similar vein. Uh, Professor No Manfredi Walzel, neurologist, Sigmund Freud Clinic. He is the madman. And the third one, and Peter is actually going to run this up on uh, and put it around the wards uh, on a photocopier, which he's got access to, is the local guy who runs the ward, the, uh, the doctor there called Dr. Manfred again, Manfred Meyer in this case, the chemical kosh man. So here he is being depicted with his sinister chemical kosh, wanted for threatening to put a healthy mind under the kosh. You might think this is a bit da uh, daring, but last time Peter did a, hand, uh, a homemade one of these and ran it up, he got support from the staff and he said it was therapeutic for all of us political prisoners and asset stripping victims uh, to see these posters going up. And we actually got some uh, nurses uh, moving the posters to more prominent places behind glass where they couldn't be moved. So well done to Ned Panfilon and we hope this further puts pressure on uh, the authorities. Peter's view now is that he is past the point of being made uh, brain dead in order to have his assets stolen. There's far too much publicity from the Foreign Office, the uh, Austrian mainstream now. But one thing that is needed is that it's Grandma B, his own mother, Barbara Hofstra, who started this case. She is still uh, totally isolated in captivity in York Social Services. And she would love, she keeps saying in her one uh, outlet a week, which is to the outside world, which is her phone call to Peter when they're allowed to make one from one captive venue to another. What she always says is, I'm so isolated, I'd love a visit. So anyone in Yorkshire can uh, please, first of all, write to her on the address on screen at Haxby Hall. For those listening, it's Barbara Hofstra, Haxby Hall, York Road, Haxby, York, YO 323DX. And if you'd like to arrange a visit, make a polite call, please, to the social worker for booking visits, Anne Macpherson, on 01904 768 944. And above all, please could some kind souls could uh, donate about a couple of thousand more, uh, because uh, the one thing that's needed now on expenses is getting a barrister to challenge York Social Services, so-called social services, uh, on their captivity, uh, because the end point for this, in terms of Peter's own view, uh, reiterated to me this morning, is not that his case will be successful, it's his mum, that she can live in peace in her own home, which was stolen from her. Right. Um, just incredible, isn't it, that uh, we, we've had those UK column reports on Melanie Shaw and the uh, Hofstra family uh, from the United Kingdom in June 2018. We're talking about the Gulag 
established in this country. We're talking about people disappearing into a prison system and we're talking about the psychiatric system being used as a weapon. This is truly sinister stuff. All three political parties are fully responsible because this system has been built under the leadership of all three parties. Um, what I believe we need, Mike, is the people who've got the courage to get out on the streets that we saw at the weekend. Um, those people could do so much more if they not only showed themselves publicly, but also they were challenge, challenging their MPs and the people running this very system on a day by day basis. Yeah. OK, Alex, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, as always, and um, we'll just end by saying um, that we have more good news. We understand that some very powerful court cases have just taken place to do with council tax. It is no question that magistrates' courts are being hired in order for local councils to carry out business. But it's also clear now that uh, the amount of information coming back into those courts is causing severe problems for the not only the court system, but also the local authorities. We'll have more on that in due course. Thanks very much for joining us. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow. Bye-bye.